Uh, you know all those images of God that we see in artwork of God wearing a crown, sitting on a throne, sitting on a cloud, angels playing harps, you know all those pictures? Um, they're all in this chapter. Yeah, <laughs> we're going to be today. We're going to look at Revelation chapter 14. And a, a lot of those images of those very common kind of, you know, popular culture images of God are from this chapter. Most of them aren't seen very many other places, but uh, you're going to see them in this chapter. So if you're wondering where they came from today, we're going to find out. Uh, we are still in the break between the blowing of the last trumpet and the pouring out of the first bowl. Uh, that's 12 through 14. So this is the last chapter in that break. As of the next chapter, chapter 15, the bowls start being poured and things start getting really, really challenging, very, very difficult. But for today, we're still in that break. And today uh, we have three sections that we're going to be looking at, the lamb and the 144,000, the first three angels, and then the last three angels. So let's start by looking at the lamb and the 144,000, beginning with chapter 14, verse 1. Then I looked, and there before me was the, was the lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Now, who are the 144,000? We saw that already back in chapter 7, verses 4 through 8. The 144,000, we believe, are the literal Israel, but they're not a literal number. We gave a whole bunch of the reasons for that back then, so we won't go into it in detail. But as a quick reminder, they are, we know that they're literal Israel because they are listed by tribe. We know that 12 by 12, which is which 12 times 12 is 144, we know that's a very Jewish number. Um, it says that it's on Mount Zion, which is where Abraham offered Isaac and where the temple was built in Jerusalem. Uh, so there are a bunch of those things happening here. And I, what I believe is happening here is a partial fulfillment of God's promise that he made multiple times to his people in the Old Testament. Uh, specifically, we'll see it here in Exodus 6, 7. Exodus 6, 7, God said to them, I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. Over and over and over again, God says, you have a special place in my heart, the Jewish people, the descendants of Abraham. So in this particular thing, it says, this is for the 144,000 and they had his name, that's the lamb's name, that's Jesus, and his father's name written on their foreheads. Now, does that mean they're literally walking up and you can read it on their foreheads? No. Again, this is apocalyptic literature. This is symbolism. The symbolism means something. And a name written on a forehead means this. It speaks to identity, ownership, and protection. The idea of the name on the foreheads, we've seen a couple of weeks already, right? We saw the picture of the phylacteries where from, from Deuteronomy, where God said, write my law on your forehead and on the back of your hand. Not literally, not physically, although some uh, Orthodox Jews still do that today, but the idea is in a place where it's seen by others and in a place where you see it when you, you, when, when you commit an action with your hands. When you do things, my name should be seen. When people see you, my name should be seen. So that's what that's all about. It's also where God said he put his name of his people to seal them. And it's where the devil tries to imitate God with the mark of the beast. So that, that's what it means. It's, it's, a, it's identifying us as under God's protection, under God's ownership, and identified by God's name. It doesn't mean that there's physically those names written across their foreheads. It means you are mine, basically, is what it means. So... I want to take a quick side detour here because often the idea of the name of God comes up in Scripture, and most preachers like me, we make assumptions about people's understandings about the name of God that we need to stop making assumptions of because when I was a kid and I was sitting in church, there would often be guest speakers come through. My dad was usually better at this than the others. But the guest speakers would come through and they just make assumptions about the name of God. For instance, they talk about Jehovah and they talk about Jehovah. And I remember as a kid even looking it up and going, oh, I, when I read the Bible, I never see the word Jehovah anywhere. What's he talking about? So let me walk you through a short, maybe five minute mini lesson in here about the names of God, because it's brought up in this passage. And it's, it's important, basic understanding for Christians that we make assumptions about that we should not make assumptions about. So what is God's name? When we say God's name was written on the forehead, what do we mean by God's name? 
Well, first of all, the first and most well-known name of God is I am who I am. Uh, in Exodus chapter 3, when God appears to Moses at the burning bush, and Moses is about to go back and he's given the order to go back and free God's people, he asks God, uh, which God should I say sent me? Because there's lots of gods with lots of names, and we don't have a name for you. And God's name that he gave to him was, I am who I am. Now, what that means in, in Hebrew was actually lost centuries ago. So God said, I am who I am, but we actually don't even know what God gave him or how to say it. And here's why. I am who I am. When the Hebrew people, when the Jewish people write it out in Hebrew, they write it out as the letters Y-H-W-H. That is also sometimes written out as uh, this is uh, this is called the Tetragrammaton, which is, if you just really want to know all kinds of interesting theological terms, next time you're in a debate with a theologian who wants to tell you what for, and they say, well, is the Tetragrammaton. That's what the Tetragrammaton is in the book. It is the word that theologians use for that four-letter sequence that the Hebrews would write down, meaning I am that I am. Just, just that I'd throw that in there to show you how smart I am. I can look stuff up on Google too. That's what <laughs> I know it from before that, but it's also known as the Tetragrammaton. It is also written out as Yahweh. So for instance, we've got a song, a beautiful song that we often sing at Cornerstone that has the names of God in it. And one of them is Yahweh. Uh, Yahweh is often in some of our um, songs that we sing. And unless it's explained to you, you don't know what is this Yahweh thing? What does that mean? Yahweh is the best understanding that we have about how I am who I am, Y-H-W-H, should be pronounced. It's the best understanding we have. Or when it's translated through the Latin, and let me get my big head out of the way here, when it's translated uh, 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 through the Latin, Yahweh became the word we know as of as Jehovah. So when we hear the word Jehovah, Jehovah is an English version of of a Latinized version of Yahweh, which is a pronounceable version of YHWH, which is the closest understanding we have of what God gave us his name as in, to Moses at the burning bush. Are you confused enough yet? So I am that I am, YHWH, known as the Tetragrammaton, just to confuse you a little more, becomes Yahweh, through the Latin, it becomes Jehovah for us today. But as, as interesting and confusing as that was, let me confuse you even more. <laughs> I, oh, there we go. I could have put myself out of the way down at the bottom and not covered up anything. I'll just leave myself there for now. That'll be a better spot and get that little pesky arrow out of the way. Okay. So it now gets even more complicated. Because if you look through your Bible, you will not find the word Jehovah written anywhere, or Yahweh, or the Tetragrammaton YHWH. In that spot in Exodus where God gives Moses his name, he will say, I am who I am, and we'll see that in a couple other places. But the idea of God calling himself Jehovah or Yahweh, we don't see that in our Bibles. Why not? Let me walk you through a, a, a little... Um, lesson in translation that I find fascinating and that I think will help you in your next Bible read-through. There are two different ways that we see, read the word Lord when we're reading it through in an English Bible, and most of us are just read it through and we don't notice this difference. You'll notice the way it's written on the screen there now, Lord with all caps, although the O-R-D, while still in capital letters, is smaller caps, right? So it's caps, but smaller caps, or Lord in upper lower. Those are the two different ways you will see the word Lord written in an English Bible. They are written that way intentionally. And some English Bibles, instead of even being the lowercase O-R-D, will be fully uppercase L-O-R-D. And it, it, it's kind of jarring at first when you sometimes see it. It's like, why are they yelling that word? They're not. It is a standardized way. The word Lord, when it's in all caps, is how we translate the name Jehovah. So whenever you're reading the Bible and you see Lord written that way in all caps, even if the second, third, and fourth letters are in lower caps, still caps, that mean, that's a translation of the word Jehovah or Yahweh or YHWH, I am that I am. So whenever you see Lord in all caps, it means God's name, Jehovah, I am that I am, okay? When you see Lord with lowercase letters in it, 
that means that is a recognition of God's title. That is not Jehovah, his name. That is Adonai, which means Lord. So Adonai in Hebrew means Lord, means the title. He is our Lord. He is the one who is in charge of our lives, and that is written as Lord in upper lower. But when you translate Jehovah or Yahweh from the Hebrew into English, they translate as that is Lord with upper and lower, uh, with all uppercase. Why all the translators chose to do it that way, I don't know. It seems confusing to me. It seems to me, why not just leave it as Jehovah? I mean, you don't have to translate a name into another language. You just keep their name the same, and you could have just kept it as Jehovah or Yahweh, but that's a translation choice that virtually every translator has made. So when you read your Bible through now, take a look for those differences, and you'll understand whether or not they are saying Lord as his title or Jehovah as God's name. Now, just to add even more, hopefully, clarity through a confusing subject, let's take a look at this. The word El means God. So the, the Hebrew word El means God. So when you see the word God, like, for instance, people will ask, wait a minute, why don't you just use the word God when you mean Jehovah? Because God has its own word, El. So L in Hebrew, again, that's not what, you won't read the word L in your English Bible. You'll read the word God in your English Bible. And almost every time you read the word God in your English Bible, it is the term L. It is not God's name. It is who God is. It's like my kids call me dad. My grandkids call me grandpa. Those aren't my names. Those are the titles they give me. L is, means God, means simply the word God, not his name. Okay. Then you've got words in the Bible from the Hebrew, like El Shaddai, El Elyon, and so on. And the, El Shaddai, for instance, means God Almighty. So again, you won't read El Shaddai. And again, it's in our songs, right? We've got songs where it'll mention the words El Shaddai, and you're going, what is that? It's not in your Bible. Well, it is, but it's translated in English, in your English Bible, as God Almighty. Here's an example of that. Exodus 6.3, where Moses is explaining to the people about what God has done, he, uh, or what God, when God is talking to Moses about this, God says, I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty. And the Hebrew for that is El Shaddai. So El Shaddai, I just added in brackets. That won't be, you won't find the words El Shaddai in your English Bible. You will just see, I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. So I've added in parentheses the original Hebrew words that they're translating. So what he's saying in the original Hebrew is, I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai, the Lord Almighty, God Almighty, not as, but by my name, Jehovah, Yahweh, the Lord, and you'll notice the all caps in the word Lord, I did not make myself known to them. So there's one verse where you've got two different versions of how we refer to God in the same verse, but because those parentheses aren't written into our English Bibles because it would just slow down our reading like crazy, they just put the translations in. But now you have some idea of how to identify those names of God as you go through it in your typical English Bible. A little longer than I expected to go on that, but I hope that helps you as you read through your Bibles from this point on. I, I like not just teaching the Bible, but I like teaching about the Bible and how we can get more out of it when we read it from this point on. So let's continue on from there. Let's go on now. To, we've got this 144,000. They have God's name written on their forehead. They are sealed before the bowls of God's wrath are poured. The, God's wrath, remember, this is the gap. 12, 13, and 14 is the gap between the blowing of the last trumpet and the pouring of the bowls. So why are the 144,000, which represents those who are descendants of Abraham who come to know Christ as Savior, why are they sealed before the bowls are poured? Because when the bowls are poured, they are direct wrath of God coming upon the earth and God has said, if you come to me, you will not be under my wrath. I will protect you from it. So that's why they're sealed at this point, because God's wrath is about to come. This is similar to putting the blood over the doorposts before the plagues in Egypt began, right? It's a, it's a similar idea to that. We then move along verses 2 and 3. I And I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of, like the roar of rushing waters and like a loud peal of thunder. 
The sound I heard was like that of harpists playing their harps. There's the harps in heaven that we've heard about so much, right? And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. So there's a special song that is now sung. Previous songs we saw were sung by everybody, acknowledging Christ as Lord. This song is a special song chosen for God's special chosen people. This designates the Jewish people in a separate way from the rest of us, and it's a command performance before the throne of heaven, before the ruling council of heaven. So this is very different from chapter 5, where everybody joined in. This designates the descendants of Abraham in a special way. All right? We now move along verses 4 and 5. These these, uh, these are those who did not defile themselves with women. This is a description of 144,000. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remained virgins. They followed the Lamb wherever He goes. They were purchased from among mankind and offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. Okay, so the first question on this is, they all have to be virgins? And if they are virgins because they didn't defile themselves with women... Does that mean if you're married and you have sex with your wife, that's defiling yourself? And three, does that mean these are all men? Because it's only referring to them having sex with women. What's going on here? Again, what book are we in? We are in the book of Revelation. How is the book of Revelation written? In apocalyptic literature, which is highly symbolic. So is there anything in the Bible that leads us to believe that if you're married, you can't have sex, that if you're married, you're having you're defiling yourself if you have sex. No, there isn't anything in the Bible to do that. Virginity does not make you holy before God. So what's happening here? What's the symbolism of virginity mean? And here's what it means. In the Bible, God calls, calls idolatry spiritual adultery. In the Bible, we are told that we, as those who have been saved and been born again, we are the bride of Christ. And there's a lot of imagery, both in the Old and New Testament, about God's people being his bride. And God wants us to remain faithful to him and to him alone. So anytime we put another value system ahead of God's, or we actually bow down and worship an idol, God, our faithful husband, looks at us as an unfaithful wife. Why are you worshiping idols instead of me? It's the same as if you were to say, why are you going and fooling around with other, other, other people when I'm at home being faithful to you? So every time we commit idolatry, anytime we put other values ahead of God's, anytime we actually physically bow down and worship an idol of wood or stone or metal, we are committing spiritual adultery. That's the defilement that's happening here. So what he's saying is, these are those who didn't, you know, cross themselves one day and then bow down to an idol of Buddha the next day and then, you know, do things however they wanted to do it the next day just to make sure all their bases were covered. These are people who say, no, I'm all in with God. I will have no other gods. It's the first commandment, right? No other gods before me. I'm not going to worship God and I'm going to worship God only. So that's what this is about. This is not about sexuality. This is about purity. This is about not being uh, idolaters. This is about worshiping God alone. So that's what's happening here. The, the prophets constantly in the Old Testament warned the people that if, as you commit a idolatry, you're actually committing spiritual adultery, and that is how God perceives it. So that's what's happening here. It's not about sexual purity, although that's an important part of our lives if we're not married to remain sexually abstinent. And if we are married to remain faithful to our spouse, that's that's impor an important part of that purity. But that this is, this is not about sex. This is about remaining true to God alone. Okay? Verses 6 and 7 then move us along. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. So this is a message for everybody. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Now we get to the second segment of this chapter, where we're going to take a look at what I'm calling the first three angels. We'll see them in verses 6 through 14. This is the first one of them. The first three angels that come along will come along to announce the mercy of God. There are two sets of angels we'll see in this chapter. 
The first three basically close out the first half of the tribulation and close out everything up to the end of the trumpets by offering mercy one last time. The second three angels that we'll get to at the end of this chapter kind of open up the next segment of this vision and the next segment of the book of Revelation by moving from one last offering of God's mercy to the final, to, to the beginning of God actually pouring his wrath out. So the first three angels announce the mercy of God, and let's take a look at what they do. The first angel, according to the verse we're looking at right now, the first angel preaches the gospel and gives a final message of mercy. As we saw, it's to everyone, to every tribe, nation, tongue, language, people. Everybody gets one last call. Things are about to get really, really bad. As bad as they've been, they are about to get worse, but mercy, the mercy door is still open at least for a short time. What's also interesting about this passage to me is this is the third time that the phrase another angel has been used in Revelation. The first time another angel was used as a phrase was in 7-2, and then later on it was used in chapter 10, verse 1. And all three times that the phrase another angel is used in Revelation, it's for God to interrupt with an option of mercy. Think about that. Pretty cool, huh? So every time you see, all three times in the book of Revelation, when you see another angel shows up, that phrase another angel, not every angel, but specifically the phrase another angel, it means God's coming in to interrupt the flow of the narrative by offering mercy one more time. This is the final another angel. This is the final opening of the door of mercy for people who are walking on the earth. And you are about to hear the garbage truck go by because the window's open because it's a warm day. If you heard that, that's what that was. All righty. Um, okay, so this is another angel. That means mercy. Let's move along now. Uh, oh, and the reason for this is because uh, God uh, gives us enough opportunities so that when we get to heaven, nobody's going to be able to say, oh, well, I didn't know. Uh, Romans 1, for instance, 20 through 21. Romans 1, 20 through 21 says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his internal, eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. God, since the beginning of the world, we can see God clearly being understood from what has been made. Look at God in creation. It's obvious there's something behind this so that men are, quote, without excuse. So he's saying nobody's going to get to heaven and have an excuse that they didn't know or couldn't, couldn't discern it. Everybody's going to have all the opportunities to accept God as they want to, okay, if they want to. But we have the option, okay? We move from there now to verse 8. The second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. So the second angel prophesies the fall of Babylon. What's going on with Babylon here? Well, we're going to see more about Babylon in uh, chapters 17 through 19. So we won't get into it now, but we'll see a lot about Babylon and we'll learn a lot about what that means later. For now, it's enough to know that in the Bible, Babylon is always a symbol of idolatry and evil and even of witchcraft. And uh, this prophecy says her, her, her doom is sure. You, it, will, it will fall, okay? Verses 9 through 10 then give us a third angel. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury. This is why the idea of accepting the mark of the beast is something that Christians are never going to do. That we'll drink if because if we accept it, we will uh, again. Verse ten: uh, drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of His wrath. So we're about to see bowls or cups of wrath poured upon the earth, and this tells us that God's fury has fully been poured into these cups. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. So the third angel warns people not to take the mark of the beast, because while the penalty is about one of the most severe pictures of hell that we'll ever have, this idea of it being a, a lake of fire we'll see later, burning sulfur, we see here. So if you put all these ideas together, what you've got here with the three angels is this. Angel one, come over to God's side. Angel number two, the other side's going to lose. Angel number three, and if you follow them, you'll lose too. So again, these first three angels, to really give a quick version of their message together, it's this. Come to our side, come to God's side, the other side's going to lose, and if you're on the other side, you're going to lose too. That's what the three angels will say. This is an explanation and an offer 
of mercy. And it's telling us that those who drink of God's wrath will do so voluntarily. The idea of the wine of God's wrath is an image that's used a lot in Scripture. Uh, in Jeremiah 51, Jeremiah 25, and Psalm 75. And it, this, it always denotes receiving God's wrath after having chosen it for yourself. It's not like it just all of a sudden comes, where did that come from? No, you've chosen to drink of it. It's like the old saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. This is not a bowl that's poured on top of my head. This is a bowl I choose to drink. Right? You, you can walk in and say, oh, I was so tempted because that bowl was there or that cup of wine was there. Or I couldn't resist the temptation. No, you picked it up and you drank it. So while the imagery that's coming up will be the pouring of the bowl, what's being explained here is that, in fact, while we're going to use the imagery of pouring later, this, in fact, is, our, 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 is God's wrath that we have chosen to pick up and drink unto ourselves. We have chosen this voluntarily. Okay. We then move along to verse 11. And the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image or for anyone who receives the mark of his name. So this tells us that those who reject God will be in torment for as long as God reigns forever and ever is what this says. This is where we get the idea of eternal torment, that that's what the penalty for sin is going to be. It's a horrible thing to think of. It's the hardest part of the Bible for me to reconcile with the, the what I know is who I know is a loving God. It's really hard. How do you reconcile the idea that God will torment people for eternity with the idea that God is love? That's one of those things, both of which are true, but I can't reconcile in my own head because God's bigger than me. There are a lot of people today, uh, including in the church, who are rejecting the idea of hell because they can't reconcile the idea of a loving God with eternal torment. And I get their problem. I get how, why they have a problem with that. I really do. I have a problem with it too. But I can't reject the idea of hell simply because I don't like it or don't understand it. It's really clear in Scripture. The pictures of hell in Scripture are very real. They are repeated. Um, Yes, there is metaphor involved. Will it be actual sulfur? Probably not. Will it be actual flames? Probably not. But the idea that it will be a place of separation from God and that it will be, let's say, unpleasant at best is something that you simply cannot deny by any honest reading of Scripture. So yeah, that's going to happen. And no, it's not pleasant. And no, I don't like it. And no, I can't reconcile that with a loving God. But it's something that we have to hold both truths in our hearts and minds and understand that they're both, both, well, they're both real. This continues on. And in fact, this idea of how do we reconcile that is actually reflected a little bit in the next uh, verse, which begins, this calls for patient endurance. Like, I know this is hard to understand. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. So we need patient endurance, those who are living through the tribulation, plus even those of us now who are trying to figure out the idea of a loving God with eternal torment. Those are hard things, but we need to understand, we need to patiently endure that until we understand it. But what he's saying here is uh, there will be widespread martyrdom during the Great Tribulation. It says, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. So we're now at the midway point of the Tribulation. God is about to purposely pour his wrath upon the earth after we have drunk of it and deserve it. And what he's saying now is, from this point on, if you know Jesus and you die, you're going to be happy that you're able to die. Because remember, we saw earlier on this idea of people who wanted to die and weren't able to. So from this point on, because it is now God's direct wrath, he's saying, yeah, I'm going to let you die and come and be, come and be uh, in, in the protection under the altar rather than face my actual wrath. Because during the time of uh, the Great Tribulation especially, uh, those who have come to Christ during the Tribulation will, be, uh, will go through a, 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 you know, as close to hell on earth as we can possibly understand. This is a reminder of why the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Right? That no more, no other time in history will that, that be more true than during the Great Tribulation. All right. So let's take a look as we continue on verse 14. I looked and there before me was a white cloud and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man. So is Jesus on a cloud. Where do we get that idea from? That's where one of several places that also says later on he'll be coming in the clouds, right? 
like a son of man with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Oh, okay. Son of man means Jesus. This is the first appearance, however, of a sickle. So what do these symbols mean? All of these are symbols. You're not going to literally see Jesus literally sitting on a cloud with an actual physical sickle in his hand. These are all symbols that mean things. So what do they mean? First of all, the cloud is always a symbol of God's presence. All the way back from the Old Testament, where they were led daily through the wilderness by a pillar of cloud, to the fact that God appeared in a cloud when the temple was dedicated by Solomon, to Jesus ascended into a cloud uh, on when he ascended into heaven, a cloud received him, right? So the cloud is always a symbol of God's presence. Secondly, the crown, which in Greek is the word Stephanos, there were different crowns. Previously, saw, we saw the crown, the diadem, which was the royal crown. This is the Stephanos. This is the the wreath that was given to olympians when they ran a race and won so it was a crown for a victory he has a victory crown upon his head and then thirdly the sickle is a symbol of the coming harvest you harvested grain using a sickle and 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 the sickle is almost always used in scripture as a negative as in this is the time when god will harvest everything and then separate the wheat from the weeds that's what this is about. So God is about to, to draw everything up to himself, and the final judgment time is coming. So that's the first three angels. Now we move to the second three angels, the last three angels. And the last, while the first three angels announce the mercy of God, the last three angels begin the next half, the second half of the tribulation, an announcement of the bowls to come, which will be announcing of the wrath of God. So first three angels announce the last offering of the mercy of God, then last three angels in this chapter announce the coming of the wrath of God. This is where the page really turns in the book of Revelation, starting with verse 15, which reads like this. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So another angel comes in, like running, rushing in with a late bulletin, but this other angel is not an angel announcing mercy. This is not a time for mercy. This is, okay, things have just shifted and judgment is coming. So the first angel comes with a prophecy of the wrath of God. So why did an angel have to rush in and tell Jesus? Doesn't Jesus know everything? Well, no. Jesus, when he walked on earth, said there was one thing he didn't know, and that was the day and the hour of his return. Only God the Father knows this. So this is the announcement of when that's going to take place. And he comes from the temple. Who lives in the temple? God the Father. So this is an announcement from God the Father to God the Son. Now I'm giving you the actual date of your arrival. And when it says here, the harvest of the earth is ripe, that word ripe actually means totally ripe to the point of rotten and withered, like that. Not like your, your yellow banana with a few brown spots. That's nice and ripe. It's the brown banana that's, you know, falling apart on your on your counter. That's that's what this word ripe means. So the first angel comes in with a prophecy of the wrath of God. Then we move to 16 and 17. So he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth and the earth was harvested. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven and he too had a sharp sickle. So the first angel announces it. Jesus harvests the earth. Then a second angel comes with the tool of the wrath of God, also holding a sickle. And this is the beginning of the fulfillment of Matthew 13, where it says this. In Matthew 13, 41, it says, The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. So he will come with a sickle to harvest. The angels will do the same thing. This is the harvesting of, Jesus used the parable of the wheat and the weeds, right? They grow up together, and he says, at the end of the days, I'll make that. The sheep and the goats, I'll separate the sheep from the goats. I'll separate the wheat from the weeds when the high final harvest happens. This is the beginning of that being fulfilled. Now we go to verse 18. Still another angel. So this is the now the third of the last three angels who had charge of the fire came from the altar. Remember the altar where the fire, the prayers of the saints, and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, take, take your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vine because its grapes are ripe. So the third angel comes with a completeness of the wrath, wrath of God. He comes from the prayers of the saints that go before God, that altar that was right before the veil that covered the holiest of holies, which we looked at a few weeks ago in that chart. 
So the first uh, the first sickle that comes through is like the big sickle that we would see uh, in popular images of, of the Grim Reaper, right? The Halloween image of the, the shawl and then the big sickle. This is more like pruning shears. So after it's all harvested in one big sweep, it's like the second angel comes in with a smaller sickle, what we would maybe call pruning shears and going, okay, what got missed? This is a, a picture of, it's not going to be a few left over. And this is going to be an absolute complete harvest of everything on the earth and everything about the earth is going to be judged. And then what happens? Verses 19 and 20. The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes, and threw them into the great wine press of God's wrath. So the wrath that's about to be poured out in the bowls will be coming from the harvesting of the earth. So everything we produce on this earth, everything good, everything evil, evil is going to be judged, and the evil is going to go through God's wine press like grapes. And what's going to be poured back on the earth, even though it's done by God intentionally with his approval and, in fact, by his initiation, what's being poured is going to be the natural results of our sin. So it tells us where the contents of the bowls about to come, it, it tells us where those contents come from. They come from us and from our sins on this earth. So that's why God has to harvest the earth, because he's got to pour it back on us. It will be the, 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 the byproduct of our sinfulness. So ver, back to verse 19 again. The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes, and threw them into the great wine press of God's wrath. They were trampled in the wine press outside the city, and blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horse's bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia. Now, what's going on here? This is about the Battle of Armageddon. This is the first indication we have, or the next indication we have, of the Battle of Armageddon, which will result in the death of millions of people. So verse 19, the evil, the sins of the earth are thrown into God's wine press, And what the result is, verse uh, uh, Armageddon, which we'll see in chapter 16, verse 16, we'll see more about the battle of Armageddon there. It says this happens outside the city. What city? Jerusalem. That's that that that's what that means there. It's about, it happens just outside of Jerusalem, and the blood will flow out of the press as high as horses' bridles. That's a good, what, eight feet, depending on the size of the horse, anywhere from four to six to eight feet high. We don't know if that means flowing that high or splashing that high, because the word that's used originally could mean either one. Either way, what it's saying is blood will be shed for a length of 1600 stadia, which is 180 miles. So what does that mean? Let's take a look at a map and we'll close it out with this. This is the typical map you will see in the back of any of your Bibles. Mediterranean Sea on the left, way, 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 way over to the right. Like if this map stretched and it continued way over on here, even further than that would be uh, modern day Baghdad or back then uh, Babylon. But this is Israel. Megiddo right here, there's a mountain called Megiddo and a valley called Megiddo right here, right here. The, 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 so the lighter it is, the more it's a valley, the darker it is here. And the, the other way around, sorry. The darker is lower and the lighter is higher. So you've got a Mount Megiddo here. And in addition to that, let me let me give you another map that shows you a little bit more. Here is Megiddo today in uh, according to a, a map of Israel today. This here is uh, is uh, is not Israel. That's occupied by that would be what Jordan, I guess. And this here is Israel. And the length of Israel from here to here is just a little over 180 miles. You can see the scale right there, right? Put the 50s, 50, 50, 50. So it's about 200 miles. Yeah, 180 miles from top to bottom. So it will start here, just outside the city, right here. So right here, you've got Jerusalem split in half, right? So, so that on this side, you've got the Arabs who control it. And on this side, you've got the Jews controlling it. You can see Beth, where Bethlehem is on that. Oh, let me go back. That jumped ahead on me there. All right. So, so basically what it's saying is, yes, the battle will take place in this valley called the Valley of Megiddo, which runs from the sea to right about here to the edge of what is now Palestinian territory today. But it will cause bloodshed through the entire length of Israel. So that gives you an idea of what's coming. So how can we call Revelation the Bible's most hopeful book? 
<laughs> I know when you're in the middle of it, it seems anything but hopeful. Well, because mercy has been offered. Those who have want to receive mercy will receive mercy. Any of the wrath that God pours upon the earth is uh, the, the fair results of our sinfulness. This is every time somebody is abused and they cry out for judgment, that prayer goes in, into the altar. Every time a woman is raped, that prayer goes into the altar. Every time uh, an elderly person is is uh, abused, that prayer goes into the altar. Every time someone is who is poor is stolen from, that prayer for judgment goes into the altar. Judgment and justice, all of those valid prayers for judgment and, and justice that have been offered throughout the millennia of Earth's history go into that altar in front of the presence of God, and that is where the, the wine press of God's wrath will come from. It will come out of our prayers for judgment, out of our prayers for justice, out of our prayers for fairness. And sin deserves that kind of punishment. Evil deserves to be, to be defeated in that kind of a way. So whether it will actually happen at that physical place called Megiddo or Armageddon, I don't know because so much of Revelation is symbolic, but there will be a war. It will be severe. There will be bloodshed. There will be punishment. But nobody at the end of it will look back, back at it and go, well, that wasn't fair. Everybody who walks through it and who recognizes the true severity of our sin will go, that was the just and right way for sin to be dealt with. Today, we don't understand the imagery. Today, the imagery is kind of scary to us. But as those who are under the blood of Jesus, who know Christ as our Savior, it doesn't have to be fearful for us because it will be a judgment of sin and not a judgment of us. So we rest in God's mercy because Revelation is the Bible's most hopeful book. Well, that's it for this week. A lot of heavy stuff. We'll see you next time.